Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, legendary session drummer for Hall & Oates, The Cult, Brian Adams, and more, Mickey Curry. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and roll? Yep, it's that time, another edition of the Rich Redman Show. Coming to you from three Canadians today. That's right, three drummers from Connecticut. Jim. Is Canadian a word? I, I, I don't know. I kind Let's of. Let's make it a word. Well, we're going to ask our guests today. But, Jim, how you been? You know, Nashville's been suffering some rough. We had a rough year with tornadoes, and we've had hailstorms and flooding. And are you okay? We've been getting hammered, but not in a good way. <laughs> Hold on. No, okay. No. Yeah, we got to do that. We got to have the cadet from from Laugh USA on Sirius. We stole the. We sample. had uh, we had a little bit of hail and wind and you know flash flooding and downpours here and there. It's been like uh, monsoon season in Middle Tennessee. Who knew? Oh God, man. Well, you know what? I was I was sweating. I was like, I turned on the mic and I I opened up Zoom and I was like drenched in sweat because I made what? it a point today. Because I made it a point today of putting this playlist together. Like I tell all my students, like you have technology at your fingertips. You can put Spotify playlists together by drummers, by record producers, by by labels, by tempos, by feels. Like there's no excuse not to be a great drummer nowadays. So I put a playlist together starring all some of the greatest hits from today's guest and i just had to have a play i just had to revisit it but today's guest jim i'm always excited but i i mean i'm off the charts excited today because today's guest is one of the world's most celebrated and most recorded drummers 40 years as the touring and recording drummer with brian adams our friend mickey curry what's up mickey hey man how nice are you, see you Rich. man thanks for joining Good us bro. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm flattered. This is really nice. Well, you know what I just said? Mickey doesn't do enough press because I was looking things up on you. I was like, this guy really is selective with interviews. If I could, if I could just get to him, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Listen, I'll talk to anybody that wants to talk about drums and drumming. You know, I, I, It doesn't matter. I could be in a gas station. You meet somebody that wants to yap about it. I, I'm happy to yap about it. You know? I'm well, just not, that's I'm not good. We're going to talk about nothing but politics. So that's probably why you're not... Uh, seeing an awful lot of me <laughs> yapping with <laughs> with other guys but i'm flattered that you asked and it's really nice it's nice to be able to sit down and talk to you well absolutely man and we have so many mutual friends we're all from connecticut i was yeah. born in norwich raised in milford you're where, where were you born i was born in guilford guilford uh, down on the shoreline just sort of uh northeast of new haven and jim you were born where danbury danbury, danbury hospital I worked for the home of rock and roll, I-95. You're familiar with oh, that, right. right? Yeah. W-R-K-I. Yeah, man. Brookfield, <laughs> Denbury. <laughs> so well, I sort of grew up with WPLR, you know, that was always, that was the sort of, because yeah. they were on, uh, they, they kicked in in the early 70s, and uh, man, it was on my little clock radio, you know. KC 101. Huh? KC 101. Yeah, KC 101 is the other mm -hmm. one, right? So. Yep. Anyway. Big stations. And there was all sorts of music being played. Like, it wasn't so segregated musically back then. Like, it was almost like the Jack FM model. Jim worked at Jack FM, and it could be like you could have, like, Sean Colvin and then the Knack and then Van Halen and then the Fugees. I mean, I, I love that model. Yeah. Oh. Well, uh, a lot of people don't know that Hartford is one of the uh, – Springboard markets for uh, Mr. Howard Stern. He worked at WCCC back oh, in the day. Oh, that's right. This is correct. And yep. if you saw his movie there, Perfect Parts, or Private Parts, or <laughs> Perfectly Private Parts. We've been, we've been yeah. wanting to rewatch that movie just for Paul Giamatti. That was one of his, <laughs> like, launching. That was one of his first roles. He's very good. He was great in that movie. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Well, listen, let's get into some drum stuff. If you guys, you know, the listener out there, we have a lot of drummers and a lot of musicians and a lot of creatives. And some people are just, we got soccer moms that are tuning into this show. And if they don't know, you know, 40 years with Brian Adams, but also a long relationship with Hollow Notes. And then along the way, you recorded with folks like Cher and Tina Turner and Alice Cooper and David Bowie and Elvis Costello and Sam Phillips and Tom Waits and Survivor and the Cult. And the list goes on and on. If you pull, if you pull up Mickey Curry on allmusic.com, you're going to get this 
and I printed it out. You know what I mean? So we're just, we're definitely going to put this Spotify playlist in the show notes and it's just scratching the surface. I mean, it truly is. And a lot of these records you played on, I could tell like stylistically, Oh, no, that's a drum machine. Oh, no, that's not Mickey. Ooh, there's Mickey. You know, I mean, you have a signature, a sonic stylistic stamp that you put on a song. And that's one of the greatest, I think, um, compliments you can have as a studio musician to be instantly recognizable within the first four bars i mean congratulations that is that's awesome really, that's that's really flattering i i don't uh, I, I don't see it and i don't hear it but um that that's really nice to hear uh, you know you i approach all those records pretty much the same way you know you go in you just don't don't want to be the weak link in the chain you know you don't want to be um the guy screwing up the track or not knowing what he's doing or, you know, being the, the, that guy. So, <clears throat> you know, you go in, you play as best you can, you know, try not to overdo anything and give them what they need to have, you know, so. I'm going to sing some Mickey Curryisms that I stole over the years, okay? So, blop, right? Do bop, do do bop, do do jish, frakum, frakum. Shaka do do block him. Shaka do do block gaga. do do block. I mean, dude, I stole all of these. And when I was coming up, like I would practice, I would like write them out, you know. Yeah. And then I and then somehow, if you were to put your playlist next to my little Jason Aldean playlist of some of the hits we have, I stole this stuff and repurposed it, man. Oh boy. What, and you know, and what I loved about the the, the um. <laughs> the unique situation that you were in with the time was starting to do session work in the late seventies, going into the eighties, the ni- huge gated monstrous drum sounds, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, wow. I mean, that's, what was the first time you heard yourself recorded? Did you get goosebumps? Were you critical of yourself? Did you pat yourself on the back? Did you buy yourself a beer? What did you, did you say, mom, yeah. did you hear this on the radio? Like, what did you do? Do you remember? Well, you know, uh, I, the first recording session that I ever did was for a low, I, I was 15. And uh, there was a recording studio up in Wallingford. It was about a half an hour drive. My mother, I loaded my drums into my mother's car. She drove me up to this place. I set up the drum kit and I played it. It was a local bank commercial. So it was the first time I heard my drums played back, you know, as I played them, you know. Yes. The thing was, you know, some 57 second thing, right? And they paid me, you know, 50 bucks or 25 bucks or something. I don't remember. But I was so excited to hear the playback. You know, you go in the control room and it's dark and they've got the big, those big red guys, you know, the big speakers. In. <laughs> you know, they're cranking this thing back. It was so amazing. Yeah, goosebumps yeah. come to mind. But um uh, after a while, I started uh, working with local bands and stuff. And the recording studio was is a magical place, man. You you know you you get in there and um, just the hearing the playback, you know, they turn those tape machines on and the, you know, you hear those drums coming through. It, it's 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 like nothing else. Yeah, it's yeah. So and so now now going back did. Is the wiki right? Did you start playing the drums at around 11 years old? Right. And then you and your brother? Did you have a yeah, brother? So it was like a family brothers, band. Yeah. Two of my brothers and I had a band called The Rack. Nice. W-R-A-C-K. Nice. And um, yeah. And we played, uh, I was in junior high school, seventh grade, and um, we played the school dances because we were all on the student council. So we got to pick the band. So we were the band. So um, anyway, we did, we did the school dances. That was great. And we were doing all the, you know, we knew eight songs and we just played them over and over and over again. You know? I love that. Um, just the idea that there was live music at the school dance. Fantastic. Yeah. And you're talking about, you know, 1968, 69, 70, right, right in there. So uh, it was really starting to take off live music, especially rock and roll music, you know, or, or, Whatever. Uh, that kind of thing only happens in movies now. Yeah. <laughs> Bands that play at school dances. Yeah, man. Well, you know, I'm kind of looking at this, this history, and the, what really impressed me was kind of going deep and, like, really researching you was that 
things happen really quickly for you. The people that you were in musical situations with, like, I think they just noticed that right away there was something special about your playing and then your groove and your feel, and there was this it factor. It's like kids go to music school, school all the time to get skill sets together to try to take a shot at this whole crazy Wild West business, but it seemed like you were playing in a cover band, then you joined another one, Tommy Mottola heard you, recommended you to someone else, it was highly visible. It was MTV. That led to something. It was just like, bam, bam. I mean, can you take us through that lineage? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, when it, you think back on how all that happened, I have no idea what it just, you know, maybe it was just pure luck that, you know, these things just followed one another. Um, I was in a local band in Connecticut called the Scratch Band, and we played around for years. We banged around all the bars and clubs and I left the band in 1980. I went into New York, um, uh, a guy from um, uh, Mercury Records, he was an AR guy, Peter Lubin was, was um, a big, you know, he was trying to help the scratch band out a lot. So he, uh, he would call me, I've got a showcase with this band in New York if you want to do it. And so I'd take the train into Manhattan and play with people and I was doing all this stuff. So I got to, um, uh, at the time, G.E. Smith uh, had left the Scratch Band a few years earlier, and he was doing a solo record. So I was working with him that's, that whole summer. Uh, I went into New York. We recorded at um, the first studio I ever worked in New York, and it was the Power Station. So Bam! The drum sound in the Power Station was... And the first day of recording, uh, I walked in, and it was Bob Clearmountain Engineering. Nice. He produced, but he was going to produce the record. So... I got to work with Clear Mountain the very first thing I ever did in New York. It's amazing. It's amazing. And you, were, yeah. you weren't even living in New York. You're just taking the train in. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, we, I was just going in and doing whatever. You know, there were a couple of bands uh, I was showcasing with. And, you know, we just whatever anybody threw my way, I, I, you know, whatever, you, just work where you can, right? Yeah, so yeah. I was, I was doing a lot of that. So I did GE's record. And then uh, uh, Peter Lubin uh, told me about this band called Tom Dickey and the Desires. And they were sort of a Manhattan, you know, uh, pop rock band. So I did their record at Electric Lady in January or February of 81. Tommy Mottola managed them. Hey. He came down to the studio to, to see how recording was coming. And, and he asked me if I'd be interested in doing some tracks for Hall and Oates. So, uh, two weeks later, you know, I'm working on the Private Eyes record with Daryl and John. And while I was in, I was in, in those sessions, uh, the day I recorded the song, the Private Eyes, Bob Claremont called the studio. He called Electro Lady and said, uh, you know, I need to talk to me. So I got on the phone with him. He said he had this kid from Canada that he had his demos and he'd love me to play drums on them, on the you know, record. And so... You know, two weeks later, I was back up at the power station working with Brian. And uh, uh, Daryl had asked me to go on the road in the fall. So they finished up the record. I went on the road that summer with GE, with his band. We, we opened for Squeeze. And you played on his debut record, right? In 81, yeah. is that right? Yeah. So um, we, we did that. That was a month uh, that summer, a month and a half. And then I was on, you know, it was, I was in the Hall and Oates band after that. Um, <laughs> you know, you take a month off or something and I'd be able to go to Vancouver, work with Brian on his records. And, you know, so it was all happening all at the same and time. And you're all of like 25 or 26 years old at the time. I was 24 at the time, yeah. Yeah. Just, just turning 24 that year. So it was good. You know, it was all good. I mean, that, that shaped the future trajectory of your life, that, that yeah. little period of your life. Jim, did you have something like an insight? It looked like you were about was, to burst. <laughs> was John Oates truly the one that went? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Was that like a keyboard sample? or what no, was that, was, that was a, that was uh, a, you know, that? That that was was a Saturday Night Live skit. And they were actually parodying Hall and Oates at one point, And they had John Oates, somebody playing John Oates. He's like, I'm John Oates. I'm the one who does. <laughs> <laughs> It was very funny. That's, <laughs> That's what this really kind of came to mind. Did Daryl, uh, did he live in his Poquag uh, area mansion at the time when he, uh, I guess before he turned it into Daryl's house now that it's known as? Yeah, no, he was living, um, he had a 
place in the village uh, had an apartment down there. I don't know about a house until much later. Yeah. He bought a house in Connecticut. Then he got out of there, and the house that he did live from Daryl's house um, was much later than that. It was two old colonial houses that he put together yeah. in upstate New York somewhere, and just amazing. The place was amazing. I, I got to play yeah. it there once. My, my cousins live in that area, and they're like neighbors with them. So. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful up there. So, so I, <laughs> I'm thinking about the hand claps. So, and I was watching yeah. the music video and everything for Private Eyes, and I wanted to maybe ask you, I don't know if you got a lot of questions about this, but I, I loved the drum sound. It was so direct. I mean, it was like right there, I feel like stylistically, one of your, your, your recording voice had started to develop because if you turn the song down, right, you still hear boom, wow. Yeah. Wow, just cutting through like it's just like it was almost like this gorgeous like kick snare metronome you it's know like you it, could hear the the sticks whipping through the air right? i mean and and a lot of killer choices like no tom fills not a lot of crash cymbals no and the hi-hat opening you i noticed stylistically you have like a little hi-hat thing where you're leaning into the hi-hat and you'll open the hi-hat a lot on the an of four and it just yeah. adds to the soup and the percolation and the mood you know but it's not like you're featuring it like you get out with the shank of the stick like carmine apathy like shh, yeah. you make it bark it's just you open it and it yeah. moves things forward but it's so what was it what was the kit do you remember was there a head on the front bass drum uh, no it was it was actually an old lug kit that I had uh, they were just maple shells I had a uh, 8 10 12 rack but I think I only used one rack and one floor for those Hall and Oates sessions uh, they wanted it simple you know they just wanted I was really just playing time for those yeah. records I, I, they wanted everything really really simple you know that they wanted Ed Green yeah, we interviewed Ed. He's a Nashvilleian. Yes, yeah. we did. You're talking about stealing stuff, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, if you... Just well, he played on Sarah's Smile, right? Did he yes, play on... Yes, he did. That's okay. Ed. Because... No cymbal, there are no cymbal crashes on that record. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, all just hats, kick and stare, and that one little rack tom that's sort of... Uh, Second that Sort of, you know, Pistol Allen, Tom Tom yeah. Phil, that snare to Tom thing. Just beautiful, man. Yeah, what was and the music I, video with the giant drumsticks? Yeah, adult was, Education? Um, no, <laughs> Adult Education was another wacky uh, video. Don't, God, don't, what was that? Because I remember that video so vividly, and it was like two guys holding giant, giant, giant drumsticks, each taking yeah. turns with the back. Out of touch. Out of touch. That's what it was. Yeah, yep. those drums are some, they're in a museum somewhere now. They the were, giant drums? They actually made drum shells and put like these like uh, sort of cloth skins on them. They were actual drums. It was pretty wacky, but it's probably you know, quite a workout. I would imagine like too. That, videos. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that radio video, Rich? Yeah, totally. Oh, totally. I mean, that's yeah. a, that was another cool thing is that you were you were coming yeah. into this as MTV was exploding, so we could yeah. like sit around and watch Mickey Curry like. 48 times a day every 30 minutes playing on either Brian Adams or John or, or Hall and & Oates yeah. and you're playing live with these guys and there was like live concerts that were featured on MTV because yeah. I because I, I I also noticed some live stuff with Hall and & Oates where you would do Sarah Smile but it would be much faster oh yeah well Daryl had a thing about he wanted tempos up Daryl had this thing about everything had to be fast like a James Brown show yeah and that's what he always compared it to you know James Brown and, and Listen to that, uh, you know, live at the Apollo, man. James Brown live at the Apollo. Listen to that record. Uh, so everything had to be really, really up tempo for Daryl. Interesting. And so, that. do you remember that record? Uh, makes me think about um, that kind of style as well. Uh, it was like Otis Redding live at the Whiskey a Go Go. It's like yeah. 1964 or something like that. I think it was the same year that the Beatles hit Ed Sullivan, and that had to be a big year for you as well, was it not? Yeah, Ringo. I saw Ringo on Ed Sullivan, and that, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know what hit me, but that, that was when I got the bug, you know? Have you got and to... Ringo, you know, Ringo's the guy. He'll always be the guy. There's no one. There, there'll never be another drummer. Absolutely. That, that has that kind of influence on, you know... On a generation. Did you meet him over the years? Were you able to, to get one-on-one -on -one with Ringo? 
I just met Ringo once, and it was really quick. We were doing a, a show, uh, one of those Princess Trust shows in London. It was back um, late 80s. I was there with Adams, and uh, Ringo was there. He was playing with all those great guys were there, Clapton and George Harrison, Ringo. Phil Collins was playing drums, um, just great. And uh, they were doing a big thing. They were going to play um, Here Comes the Sun. And um, Ringo, uh, I, I just happened to, we were sort of passing each other behind the stage and I, I just, I couldn't stop myself, you know. Yeah. Ringo, I'm, I, just, I, don't, ah, I just want to say hi. I'm, I am like your biggest fan. And he said, no, you're not. I am. <laughs> he's always got some really, he's always got some good one-liners, that Ringo. Yeah, he, he's one of those guys. Everything out of his mouth, he's like Yogi Berra. Everything out of his mouth is a gem, you know? Yeah. And it's one of those re responses where you kind of go, okay. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I took a picture with him, which was great. I don't know. I think, um, I don't know who took that picture, but somebody said, just stand here for a second. So Ring, wow. Ringo was very kind to take a picture with me. <laughs> Courtney, Courtney's got an aunt who always just has these zingers where that makes you have that reaction. But hey, hey, how you doing? Nah, I'm doing good. Not that anybody would really care. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know what to say to that. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> well, so you got Ringo in there. You got Bonham in the mix. You got Ed Green. You have all the you have the Motown guys. So you got Benny Benjamin, Pistol Allen. Yeah. You're, I can't. The thing is, is I can't tell. I mean, I know the Motown guys, but I don't. I can't tell which when it's Uriel, when it's Benny, and when it's, you know. Yeah. Well, do you, you know the difference. I, think, or? I I can sort of tell when it's Pistol Allen because there, there's the um, uh, standing in the shadows of Motown, and then and then there was a big Funk Brothers, PBS thing or something. I don't know. It was a documentary on the Funk Brothers, and uh, they talked to Pistol. And he shows the difference between how each one of those guys plays that does get Oh, gotcha. The, the pakatum fill, right? Pa yeah. pa so he shows how he plays it. And then well, this is how Benny played it. And, you know, it's exactly the same thing. And then, <laughs> and then he says, and this is how Uriel played it. And it's exactly the same thing. So, yes, you don't know which of the three guys is playing anything. But I think um, he talks about uh, Benny played all the straight – for stuff. He, he wasn't a shuffle guy. His shuffle was horrible. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was always Pistol or Uriel was a bit later, I think. So it's probably Pistol Allen on all the shuffle stuff. So like Pistol, you're up, man. We got triplets here. You're up. Yeah. I'm yeah. out. I'm going to get a coffee. <laughs> but then you got right. Jack Ashford. Got dotted, we got dotted eighth notes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jack Ashford playing those, those uh, tambourines. Oh, you know, yeah, man. You take that out of the mix. I tell everyone, you're not going to have a Motown recording if you take no. that tambourine out of the mix. No, the tambourine is flawless. And he is, he is that in the, especially in the standing in the shadows of Motown thing, he's playing, man. It's like it's part of his hand, you know? He's, yeah. He's incredible. It's so much a part of that sound. It's now, in the, in the heyday of your recording where you were probably, you know, pulling an Aaron off and flying coast to coast and you got your kits and cartage and producers are like, let's go, Curry, get behind the drums, man. We got another number one. Like, were you, would you take the time to do some percussion overdubs or would you say, man, I got to catch a flight and some other guy would come in and rattle? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, if they asked me to play percussion, I would play percussion. Oh, but, you awesome. know, for me, percussion is a tambourine or a shaker or, you know, a cowbell. Yeah, you know, I, I got to do some bongos on a, a track um, for uh, Jim Steinman was producing some track. It's a couple of songs for uh, Celine Dion. Kenny had done most of the record, uh, Kenny Aronoff, and um, he, oh, was this the oh so said, was this Meatloaf or Celine Dion? It was for Celine Dion the, ah, the gotcha. bongos, <laughs> but yeah, no, I also did a I did a couple of things for Meatloaf uh, and. It was um, Russ Teitelman was producing, and he asked me to come in and play drums on a couple of things. Uh, I think only one of them actually made it. was a compilation of greatest hits or something for Meatloaf, so I was thrilled to get to do that. Plus, I got to work with Russ Teitelman, you know, more than once, so. Yeah. Fantastic. I, lo you I love probably that know all these guys. I don't yeah, know I mean, I'm thinking, of the, I'm thinking of that gentleman. I'm thinking of Bob Clearmount, and I'm thinking of you working with all these heavy producers, the Bob Rocks of the world, yeah. the... Um, I should know this, but he did uh, Shania Twain and Def Leppard and Hello. 
Mutt Lang, Mutt Lang. All, all these guys. And, and so I was, what, what would you say the commonality between these kind of world-class producers is? Is it that they know exactly what they want or is it the fact that it's perhaps that and they're open to outside opinions and influences or, or what is it that makes their formula for success so solid? Well, I don't know. Most most guys have their own sort of approach. You know, Clear Mountain just lets you play. You just he gets these great, amazing sounds, and then he just leaves you alone. You just play. Yeah. You know, he never says, "Oh, I don't like that," or "Don't do that," or "I'd rather you did this." Or there's none of that. He just loves everything you do. Bob Rock is kind of like that. He just whatever you do, great because that's why he hired you. You know, Love he hired that. you because you do what you do. Uh, Mutt Lang, um, Mutt's got a sort of, um, he takes his time and he has to hear it. It's got to feel right to Mutt. It, it, it's not so much that he's, he's got it already in his head, but, um, you know, he knows when it's not right. So uh, Is, you just keep working on stuff with Mutt. I was lucky though with Mutt on a lot of those records, uh, the Adams stuff we did, I was done in one or two takes with Mutt, which was fantastic. You know? Nice. Um, I remember working, we did uh, Have You Ever Really Loved a Woman, uh, one of Brian's songs down in Jamaica. We, we, he had a house down there. So we set up, the drums were upstairs in the house. And Mutt and Brian were downstairs in the control room. And I thought this is gonna take a week to get a hi-hat track, you know, thinking Mutt was gonna really be sort of picky and try to, you know, he's, he's gotta get it right. So uh, I was thinking, man, this is not going to happen. So Paco De Lucia was playing guitar, and they had him in there for a couple of days, layering guitars and layering guitars. And I'm thinking, if Paco De Lucia is going to take two or three days to get a guitar track, uh, it's going to take me a week to get a drum track. I I'm, I'm here for the long haul. So anyway, they got that done, and uh, I went in. Okay, roll the tape. Okay, here comes the song. And I play through. And it's dead quiet. There's no, no one saying anything at the end of the take. And I thought, oh, man, here we go. Mm -hmm. So I hear on the talk back, uh, Mutt says, uh, Mickey, man, I think you got it. Yeah, I think we're done. And I went, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're, I get, now we're just going to do a hi-hat track, right? And we'll start there. <laughs> you know, I thought, and he said, no, man, I, I come down and listen. So I went downstairs and listened, and he was happy. It was done. It was finished. We did. I put one little drum fill uh, in the bridge of the song for him. Oh, so you're upstairs and they can't even see the terror on your face. I was terrified. <laughs> I, it really was terror. I was so scared that I was not going to get this thing done and, you know, it was going to be horrible and, you know, it was going to be a nightmare. But, and every time I worked with Mutt, it was like that. He just, whatever, yeah. you know, just whatever well, that, I played, he was fine. That's, with, a, you that's a testament to your, to your talent and the it factor. And I think more than anything, what any musician looking to cultivate a lifelong career has to have, which is pure gut instinct and intuition about what a song needs. And if that doesn't work, you have other ideas and options in the bag of tricks that you could pull out. How about this? Yeah. How about this? Yeah. Have you guys seen the Metallica documentary back in from 1991 when they recorded the Black Album with Bob yeah. Rock? Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty close to he, he uses a lot of psychology. <laughs> I mean, in those scenarios where they would take 10 months to record an album, yeah. and they were, you know, burning up all the record company's money with uh, studio rentals and all yeah. that stuff. But uh, I mean, is that kind of how he was when you worked with him? Um, I, I'm not I'm not sure, uh, you know, my, you're talking about Mutt, right? Bob Rock. Oh, Bob Rock. Yeah. Uh, no, Bob, I, I don't know how, he, he sort of knows uh, what he wants to get. You know, he's got an idea in his head. I don't know how he works with Metallica, I, you know, but I know, how, <laughs> I know how he worked with me on those uh, records I did with him. You know, the cult he was like really fast. He was like embedded with them. Yeah. Yeah, it was nuts to watch. It was very insightful to see how the whole thing works. Yeah, he, he's, when you're he's a pretty talented old. guy. It's just, um, yeah, I'm not sure, uh, you know, I know Metallica is probably, I know Lars really wants to get it right, man. You know, every yeah. note is really important, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, 
and you know those records are just crazy good. Yeah, here's There's a question for the both the of you. Answer. The whole thing with you know, and you mentioned the cowbell before, and I kind of squeaked out the cowbell. Yeah. When we think about that, we think of the classic Saturday Night Live trick yeah. track with uh, a skit with Will Ferrell and Christopher Walken. Yeah. That's got to be. Free, you know, does that kind of stuff still happen? It's had to have happened in the past. It's got to be based on reality. Yeah. I, I would, well, yeah. I, I think they sort of probably took the, um, you know, Explore somebody. Explore the space. Yeah. <laughs> somebody knew something about how it works when you're recording a track, especially a, a track like that, you know, Blue Ice Development. <laughs> it's funny because I, I am uh, presently, I'm doing some stuff with Joe Bouchard, who was uh, in Blue Oyster Cult. And mm -hmm. he talks a lot about how, I mean, he thought it was hysterical, you know, the more cowbell <laughs> thing in the whole, but, uh, <laughs> but was, that, was, that, was that kind of like a, um, a myth, but somewhat reality for, for them in that scenario? Or was just, hey, we just <laughs> I had freak, I don't know. Right. I, mean, I mean, you know, none of the real guys are there, right? It's all just a spoof on the, on the record. Yeah. Um, and what's his name? Bruce, uh, whoever the guy was. A producer. Yeah, Bruce Dickinson. Bruce. Dickinson. Dickinson. Guys, I put my I put pants on one leg at a one time. One leg at a time. <laughs> when I do, I make gold records. I mean, it is cla <laughs> Mickey, here's so funny. Speed, we're talking, we were talking before we started rolling about um, the Mohegan Sun, which I'm sure we've played, both played a million times. Yeah. I um, jumped up on stage with Blue Oyster Cole and played that cowbell part no! at the Wolf Den. And, and your the look of sheer concentration on your face was I, just I didn't want it flaming. I wanted solid. it to be like just locked with the drummer, man. You know, so I'm there I am behind the the drum riser, like behind it, just like boom, boom, boom. I mean, Dude, just, you should have explored the studio so, space. That's what you had to do. It's crazy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you, were playing, you were playing with them? I jumped up, yeah, yeah. The, cause you the, just jumped up there and started whacking the cowbell? No, they don't, they're like, come on up. I mean, it's like apparently a, Andy, they, they have Andy guests to come up both? and do that. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to MusiciansMortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. So when you when you were, um, you know, all you had all the frequent flyer miles and you're you're flying everywhere. Did you keep a kit in New York, a kit in Los Angeles, or did you just get backline kits? Yeah, I had a kit. I, I always had drums in New York uh, stored there, but in LA, um, uh, uh, Paul Jameson would help me out when I did those records in LA. Oh Jamo. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jamos Drum Reynolds. And he, you know, we got to be really good friends. Uh, we were working a lot together all through the 80s and 90s. So Amazing. He had a couple of great old Gretsch kits. He had a, uh, some Yamaha stuff, a, lot, a million snare drums, you know, you could pick from. So all those T-Bone Burnett records and um, Mitchell Froome stuff, uh, it was all Jamos yeah. and kits. You know, and you have put something together. this 40 year relate a long time relationship with yamaha drums yeah 82 that's incredible i mean what is that we're looking at the 90s we're looking at like 30 something years right yeah 
I mean, yeah, was, they're great drums. I, I, I have some recording the, customs. Oh, it was 40 years, dude. Yeah. yeah 40 years? Mm-hmm. There's my math. <laughs> we're drummers. We're drummers hey, well, and radio I, I count to we're four. Math. I know. In, yeah. I count to four over and over again. I, I, don't keep right. throwing numbers at me. You're gonna you know how I play in seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. That's not right. Yeah, right. That's how it goes. Yeah. Is it? No. <laughs> it was Sev. Yeah, no, Sev. Sev. You're right. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Hey, speaking of, you know, you're taking, if you guys are just uh, listening to this, you're not watching this, Mickey just took a sip of something. <laughs> Every coffee. okay, so I'm huh? drinking coffee too. So yeah, every interview I've ever seen you do, you have a gu- you have a cup of coffee in your Is hand. That right? Yes. Wow. It's in- so well, you're a fan. Yeah, I love coffee. I, I mean, I'm not drinking as much of it now as I used to. I used to drink coffee all the time. Yeah, as you probably do as well when you're working. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're in the studio, the only thing that's uh, giving you that edge. Yeah. It is the caffeine. So, and you know, uh, yeah, I've always been a coffee guy. I love it. So this is actually decaf coffee I'm drinking right now. Oh, yeah, at this because point in the day, yeah. 100, when you turn 114, you have to be really careful about it. No, because it's, <laughs> it's 545 in, on the East Coast. And so like you're, you're kind of, you guys are winding down. I still haven't even gotten my run in today because I was practicing the Mickey Curry songs. It was uh, so fun, uh, man. Really, uh, really fun. Uh, <laughs> hey, so... As the um, the technology was progressing in the eighties, and you had like sequencers and clicks and the synclaviers and all that kind of stuff, like on the Tina Turner records and stuff, a, a real common disease for a lot of guys playing that style. Would you'd be forced to play the the dub the two handed sixteenths on the hi hat, you know the do do got. I never yeah. felt like you did a lot of that. I felt like you no. did more of the, that would be happening in the track and you would do eighth notes on the hi-hat. Yes. Yeah. Or you insinuate the 16th, you know, with your right hand. Da, 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 da. Da, da, yeah. Sort of just, you know, get the, that little sort of ghost note. Yeah. Between the eighth. Um, yeah. James Gadsden style, right? Yeah. Like the, uh, the master of the 16th. Yeah, nobody does that. Better. Oh, you could, but, you know, you just sort of go for the, I always hear 16th anyway on those sort of medium tempo tracks, right? I hear that 16th in my head. I don't know if you do. I do. I a hear like a shaker in, in my head, like a guy playing a you shaker. Have that. I always have that little sort of egg shaker thing going on in my, in my head when I'm tracking those medium tempo yeah. tracks. So that little 16th thing wants to come out and uh, it doesn't come out full, but it, it, it definitely... Uh, you know, is in, in there. Now, now you're on cuts like a knife, right? I don't want to speak out of turn. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so cover bands all over the world, just, just destroying the feel on that song. They do it way too fast or they don't capture the pocket on it. But am yeah. I right in sailing, saying on the verse of that, there's a little bit of that, like, Ooh, God, go, go, God, a little bit of the right hands, but not the whole time like that. Right. But just kind of in there, like, do. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's, and that's what I mean by that. You know, it's like the 16ths are in your head, but they're not all coming out. Um, you know, the whole idea with that, especially um, songs like that medium tempo thing, is to just get the weight, get that left hand back, you know? You don't want to, those aren't edgy songs. You don't want to be pushing them. You want them to sit as far back as you can. Yeah. You know, uh, it's that John Bonham thing. You know, Bonham had that magical left hand where it would just, he's got all that inside stuff going on and that left hand just drops. A hammer. Ever so slightly behind. You know, yeah. Hammer. It, but you, I mean, that's, you've made a whole career of that of, as determining the, the weight and the importance of where that thing is going to fall and just dropping it. And to be able to do that with or without a click for three and a half minutes is really the test. That's the thing. Then you've made an entire career out of that. Year after year, the phone keeps ringing. It's because you, yeah. that's your instinctual thing. Yeah, and that's what it is. I mean, it's where I'm comfortable at those particular tempos, you know. And fortunately for me, it works out where that's sort of the groove that they're looking for for those particular songs. You know? Saw you on a, a Yamaha groove night, and you did um, an Otis Redding track, yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, you could see all the smiles on all the horn players and everybody in the band. Yeah. They're just like, oh, shit. 
You know, like yeah. this just got real. Well, that for me, that was the most intimidating night I've ever spent in, in my life or actually the whole day. And look at the guys that were there, right? I, I mean, you got Dave Weckl standing there watching you. Don't and you're, and you're like, shoot. Boom, God, dude. I mean, just it's like, <laughs> oh, here we go. I was a nervous wreck. I, I just, I put my head down and prayed that the three minutes would go by in a minute and a half, you know, because you, you, you don't want to play in front of those guys, you know. Ricky Murata is guys, a great guy and he's really funny and he put that whole thing together. So, are they, are they just sitting off stage like this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't, I, I doubt anyone was actually listening or watching. So, they probably went, and that was time for a snack or go get some coffee or something. Arms crossed, just making the what's up face. <laughs> yeah, what's up? <clears throat> that was really fun, though. I mean, I got to meet all of my heroes. You know, Russ Kunkel was there. Oh, yeah. Um, just fantastic stuff, man. It was really, it was a really fun time. Yeah. Dave Maddox was fantastic. And oh, yeah. He did a, a, a little intimate drum clinic right before COVID at Fork's Drum Closet. And there was like maybe like, 10 of us upstairs and he was talking about all these little tricks to like reduce snare buzz and how to get a million different sounds out of one snare drum and the importance yeah. of using like here's a here's what a backbeat sounds with a 7a and a 5a and oh, a 5b nice. and now we're going to throw some tea towels on the drums and like all the attention to detail yeah. stuff of being somebody that works for the world's greatest singer songwriters yeah. you know he's he is a master he is a master at um just you know how to get the the drum sound matched to the drum track matched to the song yeah he's he's so good at that you know yes for sure now now i'm yeah. sure that there's a lot of producers and uh tracks you played on where they're like um it's a black beauty it's a uh, acrylite it's a uh, superphonic you can't go wrong with any of those and every company on the planet now makes their version of those drums if yeah. you couldn't get one of those drums or the producer wasn't necessarily picky or married to the black the five and a half black beauty or the six and a half black beauty what is there a Yamaha drum that that you could always count on to provide a signature sound like that? Uh, I yeah, I've always had a seven inch birch shell. Mm. Always from day one, it was the first snare drum Yamaha made for me. It was that uh, a recording custom, and it was the Steve Gadd black piano finish. You know yeah. uh, that kit, but they made they gave me a seven inch birch snare drum with that kit and i i don't know man I, I put a cs batter on that drum and i tweaked it where i needed it and that thing uh just honked so clear mountain fell in love with that drum so we got to use that um so you know i always i've always had them i probably got six or eight of them now you know different ones but they're all that birch shell um snare drum i've used them on everything man most of those records all the hollow notes well, the later Hall and Oates things. Uh, Private Eyes was the old Ludwig kit. But I use that seven inch bird shell on everything. And Bob Clear Mountain loves a black beauty. He, he just loves that. So that's always in the room as well, you know. Did you slam rim shots or are you playing dead center in the head? No, it's always, I'm always on the rim. I don't me know. I, I can't, it's hard for me to not do that, to drop, it's hard to not drop the stick yeah. on the rim. I mean, unless you, uh, you're really focusing on something, you know, it's a maybe, I don't know, a ballad or something where you really need that big fat oomph. You know, That's you great because I, I talk to a lot of guys and they're like, Rich, you play shots on 99? I was like, 99% of the time yeah. I'm playing shots unless we're going for like an Eagles or a Fleetwood Mac where you're just That's like. That's the point, right, exactly. You know, tape it up yeah. and. Doof. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, uh, uh, you're you amazing to watch. Uh, oh, so, man. Uh, Thank you. Whatever you're man. doing, man. I stole, I stole, and just kept stealing. Um, yeah, but you, it's you. You worked with- People are stealing uh, from you. Well, you know, this is what we do <clears throat> generationally. Um, That's right. I was going to say, you worked um, with on a Rodney- Can I ask a quick question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, about their Yamaha <laughs> endorsement. What, what do you want? You're looking to get one too, Jim? Are you looking? To, oh, you want a Yamaha endorsement? It's so funny. They're just handing them out, right? 
You ever, you ever like, uh, you know, be like, hey, you know, I like Yamaha drums. What about uh, you guys uh, want to throw a motorcycle my way or an ATV or something? <laughs> you know, I've I need had one for the farm. People ask me about that. Yeah. <laughs> you, well, you can get motorcycles, right? <laughs> I need an outboard Evan engine for crying out loud. All right. You know, come on. It's Yamaha. <laughs> different division, pal. Yeah, totally different division. Um, what was I about yeah. to talk to Jim? I was, or did you ever have the piccolo thing going on? Was there a, a period of time where you, had, where you had a piccolo thing? Going I on? love piccolo snare drums. Yeah. I love them, but nobody likes them anymore. Like, or nobody, you know, you hit, you, you set one up on the side, right? Yep. You always have a second snare drum for me. Right? Yeah. There's always that one to the left of the hats and you can just whack away at that thing whenever you feel like, you know, doing something. So, uh, I've tried and tried and tried. You know, you set it up and you play the track and you just whack away at that thing once in a while. And, uh, eh, no, no, I know. we don't. It, it had a shelf life. Um, so I'm, I'm going to interview the early Aaron. Early 90s. Yeah, yeah. Aaron Comas tomorrow, yeah. the, the drummer from the Spin Doctors. And so it's oh, that, yeah. that song was just like that they had sold a lot oh. of pickles. Wow. That, that's a great <laughs> drum track, man. He's, that is, he's also he Pearl Jam. so good. Oh, yeah. He is so like, good. Crazy it inspired game. me to buy a uh, three and a half by 14 pearl free floater maple oh. back in the day. Swack. So yes. good. So so everybody's got to have a piccolo, but my, you know, mine shows up in cartage and it never gets used. It's always, yeah. it's, it's always a five and a half drum. Yeah. yeah. You can well, use it. It's, it's funny. I, I have a, um, <laughs> well, what? Jim's always every, trying to, to borrow, <laughs> ge borrow gear from me, but never give it back. Every time I'm like, we have, a, we have an actual video where I go through all of Rich's stuff. He's got a, a big case of snare drums, which I'm sure he plays like one or two, and the rest just sit there and collect dust. And it's all me just <laughs> looking through stuff going, you want this? <laughs> you going to use this? That's too good. <laughs> me just mooching off of them. <laughs> So, Jim, check this out. Check this out. Now, look at this list. If you, if you look at the different types of people that Mickey's worked with in the studio, and this is around the touring with Hall & Oates, touring for 40 years with Brian Adams, he still manages to get all these records. But as far as, like, singer-songwriters, you've got Elvis Costello, Marshall Crenshaw, Tom Waits, Rodney Crowell, Carly Simon, Steve Winwood. Then you get into the divas. So you got Cher, Celine Dion, Meatloaf, Tina Turner. Then you get into bands – like Honeymoon Suite and Survivor, solo efforts like Eric Martin and Debbie Harry, a saxophone smooth jazz record with David Sanborn. Now that's just a testament to your musicianship. And then it gets weird. We're going to talk about this category. Michael Kamen, Pavarotti, Steve Vai, and Joe Pesci. <laughs> we need to talk about hey, the last going, category. Uh, Joe Pesci. <laughs> What the hell? Hey, guys, it's a Joe Pesci show, huh? I'm telling you. <laughs> a little that. bit. A little bit. You're obnoxious today, Jim, but we love you Thank so you. much because you're just a likable guy, so we'll put up with you. <laughs> I tell you what. You's looking at me. <laughs> oh, that's Not a bad impression, good. actually. That's kind Not, of off the, off the top of my good. head. You guys are, you're both oh. good at that. <laughs> Joe Pesci. <laughs> Rich, Rich just naturally sounds like Joe Pesci. <laughs> I know I'm very nasally and and and. and, and <laughs> Joe Pesci was so much fun to work with, man. What what is that? What is that story? We, T Bone T Bone Wolk, uh, and I got asked to do the Joe <laughs> a Joe Pesci record, and if he was going to sing, it was going to be the character from uh, the movie Good, uh, Goodfellas. Yeah, no, the other one uh, where he the cowboy boot he wears. Casino? Um, Cowboy boots. Oh, 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 my cousin Vinny. My cousin Vinny. So right. Vinny, yeah. Vinny, my cousin Vinny sings Just For You was the, was the, was the record. <laughs> so T-Bone and I got asked to go in and do some tracks. So we went into, um, I think it was at Record Plant in New York. And I'm thinking, uh, I can't do this, but I'll try. You know, a lot of it was sort of up-tempo, sort of swing uh, not, not really my thing. And um, Joe Pesci's a great guitar player, by the way. He's wow. He, can, he really? really plays. He can really play. So, uh, and he loves music. You know, he's he's a big fan of of all kinds of stuff. So, he was so much fun. We spent I don't know four or five days. We did a bunch of tracks. Uh, half the stuff I played was just not very good, but I had so much fun doing it. 
he um, he was really funny and he was he was just a blast. He's such a sweet guy. He was really nice to everybody, and we had so much fun. The last uh, day, uh, he Robert De Niro came in. He asked him to come in and listen to the stuff. So he comes in and he's you know he does that thing. He's sitting in the back of the control room and they listen. They, they listen down to three or four things. I bet. So. Uh, <laughs> stuff finishes and everybody's sort of waiting for somebody to say something and <laughs> Pesci looks at De Niro and says, so what do you think? You know, what do you think? I mean, it's good. You know, it's, it's good. It's not bad. It's all right. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. He had no opinion about death. Yeah, nothing. It meant absolutely nothing to him. He's not a musical guy. He didn't care. And, uh, but it was the classic De Niro face with the, yeah. With the good. down, with the, ha, huh, you do that face, Rich. Robert, I mean, Robert De Niro is not crazy about music. I guess there's those. Well, I don't know. I'm, I, I shouldn't have said that he wasn't a fan of music. I, he just didn't. It, it, it was not his thing. You yeah. Know? He didn't yeah. want to have to have an opinion on what he just heard. He has the enthusiasm of an it. iceberg. <laughs> I got to look up this. Yeah, I don't want to commit. I don't want to commit. All right. It was I like it's not in my interest to commit right now and tell you that I like the song. All right. And the music that you did. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you that I like it or I that's don't like thing. it. I'm just going to stay right in the middle, and that's it. All right? <laughs> but, Bobby, come on. You're not going to tell me what you like? Yeah, well, tell you me what you the like room. the song. You were obviously in the room because that's exactly how the conversation went. <laughs> Jim, you know, you, I don't remember with, you being there. <laughs> working with Joe Pesci, you must have been sitting there going, "Don't ask me if I think you're a comedian. Don't ask me if you think I'm, if I think you're funny. Really yeah, please funny. don't ask me that." Yeah. That's a, really good. No, I make you laugh. <laughs> well, you think I'm funny? You think I'm like funny? Like clown. What the? <laughs> what funny what's so you funny like about clown? me? Yeah. Yeah. All right, but Jim, take a breath. Fun. <laughs> take a breath, Jim. Get a sip, take a sip of something. I'll go sit on my hands. <laughs> so well, that's great. Gotta, so I got to look that up. I mean, because I saw it on the discography and I was like, oh my God, I've got to go check that out. Yeah. It, 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 listen to everything but the drum tracks because everything is fantastic. But some of the drumming is really weak. So ah, no, Does anybody what, know that really? story though that you just told? Did Ooh. we get a scoop? Sure. I've never told that. To oh, anybody. It's it's exclusive. Ever asked. Nobody's yeah. ever asked me about that record. And then what yeah, about well, Steve Vai? What was that? What was that? Uh, I don't know. What did I do with Steve Vai? I know. Who knows? Maybe it was just something over the year. You, did, you played a tambourine on beat four or something, but you don't remember. And you're what on like a 32. Um, Jim, ask a question about drums or Brian Adams, and I'm going to look this up. <laughs> well, I'm still fascinated about the Robert De Niro thing. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, De Niro I mean, was, that's it was great. What a thrill, right? You that's got to be surreal. But it was it was a bit nerve wracking doing those tracks, but uh, it was really fun. He's a what he's time really frame was that? What year? Like when? What era? Oh, I'm gonna say ninety eight, late nineties. Yeah. Late nineties. Yeah. So they had already done Casino and Goodfellas oh, yeah, all that and all stuff. that. He was he yeah. was you know the big giant movie star. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was. Well, De Niro at the time was doing uh, Meet the uh, um, Meet yeah, the Meet Paris. the Fockers. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. And then he did. Uh, analyze this that was around that time so I he was, he was movie, huge man. i love billy crystal was so good in that movie oh, he was somebody awesome. call the vatican see if something's missing <laughs> you want a fresh one <laughs> <laughs> and also uh a lot of people don't give them an, enough credit for heat he yeah. was great in that movie yeah. that was the first i always tell people Heat was the first movie that you ever see al pacino and robert de niro in the same scene together yeah great movie Pretty amazing. Think Check this it. out. Yeah. Steve Vai, 2005, Archives, Volume 4. Really? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Because I, 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 I know Dina Carter. I worked with her <clears> in Strawberry <throat> Wine. She's good friends with Steve Vai. Yeah. So I could, I could ask Dina to ask Steve yeah. on behalf of Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> Only because uh, if it's, it might have been a track... I did for someone who, and, or whatever, it ended up with him somehow. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know what that would be. What about Nashville, Mickey? Did you ever go down there and work with anybody? Because they're on yeah, a couple I, Rodney Crowell records and stuff. Well, the Rod, I, did, I did a couple of things with Rodney Crowell, a couple of just two songs, but that was a blast, too. That was so much fun. Do you know Rodney? Have you worked with him? I, sure I have friends who have, and he's like this mythical character, of he's course. He's fantastic. Yeah. Man. He was so much fun. It was Stuart Smith and me, and um, 
Um, we, we, we just had such a great time. It was really fun. Larry Klein played bass. And, um, wow. Rodney's so funny. Man. We were laughing the whole time. We would start, you know, I'd, I'd start counting the track, the song. So you go, one, two, three. And you'd hear, and take off that little shirt. And you, you go, what? Hold on, what? And go, uh, he sure got a pretty mouth on him. And you, that's what you hear from the vocal booth. You go, what is he doing? So Stuart Smith's dying, laughing. And Larry Klein's going, what are you, because Larry was producing the track, what are you doing? And it was all the, those goofy lines from Deliverance. Yes. You know, the two guys in the, he sure got a pretty mouth on him. So that was, that was the end of trying to get a take, you know, without everybody just losing it halfway through the song. But and that so, was Rodney's sense of humor. We were, wow. And do you remember the studio you did that? Was it at Treasure Isle Studios? I'm um, not sure. It was in L.A. It was a small. Oh, it was in L.A. Very, okay. okay. It was a very small studio. I don't remember the name of the studio. But I met Bobby Columbia that day. Oh, from Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Oh, man. Come on. Who? who Bobby Columbia's everybody's hero. Yeah. This guy. And he was telling stories, road stories, and recording stories, and studio stories. And I spent all day just listening to these guys yap. And, wow. You know, we got, I think we got two tracks done. So that took, you know, eight minutes. And <laughs> the rest of the day we sat around and I just listened to these guys go. It was so much fun. Yeah. Well, I think, I think you know how to read the room. I think that's another thing that's probably attributed to much of your success is reading the room and trying yeah. to figure out what people want and what, what's that ecosystem in there and what are the expectations of yeah. you, you know? Well, you know, you're, you, you know you, you've been in the studio a million hours. You, you know that you have to, uh, you got to sort of fit yourself into whatever the scene is, right? Like the, your personality has to sort of slip and slide right. and, and in any given situation. So you know sort of when you can let loose or when to just get to work and, you know. Yeah. I mean, of course, you always, you know, stay professional. At, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Well, so, I was going to say, um, you know, I don't want to keep you forever, but I think we would be, it would be a mistake to not talk a little bit about the ecosystem that is working with Brian Adams for 40 yeah, years. Sure. Um, do you guys, just because I, you know, there's like 99% of the bands that are coming at least out of like, you know, Nashville and LA um, with high production value, everyone's on clicks and Pro Tools and yeah. Ableton and there's sequences. And I mean, do you guys just like this, Brian, go one, two, count it off? Or do you have a tempo reference or you're pulling it out of thin air? Or like, how does it work? It, it, it's all of those things and, and it, it's, it's the other stuff as well. You know, some songs have click, some songs have a sequence huh. bit. A lot of the songs are just off the floor. You know, he just counts it in and we go. Uh, but, you know, he, he plays the song for you. You come up with some things. He's usually got ideas. I know Jim, Jim Valance, who was his writing partner for years and years and years. Jim co-wrote a lot of the big hits. Uh, Jim's a great drummer. Like, amazing. So, you know, he always had ideas, and um, there might have been a demo with a drum track that Jim played, so I would just sort of copy that and maybe, you know, do my little thing here and there. But, um, yeah, Adam's, uh, it, it's all of those things. There's, there's uh, you know, a, that whole spectrum of uh, how songs are, are done. Yeah. yeah. But the ones that, for me, that really work are the ones just off the floor. We've played together for so long. You know, Keith Scott is an amazingly great guitar player yeah. and idea guy. And, you know, we don't even have to look at each other. You just go and know where he's going. You know? There's so, that unspoken language like Aquaman. Yeah, you know. Fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's true. You know, yeah. you, you don't have to uh, worry about what's coming out of the guitar amps. You know, it's all going to be great. So, is Gary still playing keys with you? Yeah, guys? Gary's playing keyboards. Uh, fantastic, man. He's he's a blast. He's so talented too. Super talented. He's yeah. just great, and uh, he's funny, and and he's he's really wonderful to work with. So we're, I'm really lucky. He's great. Touring wise, you think that uh, maybe the end of this year, or are you guys going to wait till next year? I have no idea, man. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on. What, um, you know, you you guys are probably in the same boat, right? That's right. Hurry up and wait. Yeah. Yeah, you just wait until and see, and then you know you make you make your decisions about you know where you're going and what you're doing when the time comes. But as Steve Gad once said, "We'll burn that bridge when we come to it." 
good. <laughs> And, and that's an, another thing that I've like seemed to notice about you is like, it seems like you have been able to all these years operating at the highest levels of uh, velvet ropes and limos and private jet. You've resisted and escaped all the trappings of, of rock and roll. Yeah. I mean, good for you. I was never that guy though. You know, I just want to play. I, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to live any of that stuff. It, it, you know, it's way beyond m- m- what I ever wanted to do. I just want to play drums. Yeah. You know, I want to get on stage and I want to get in the studio. If I could just walk into a recording studio every day and put drums on something, I'd be the happiest guy in the world, you know? Well, I think people pick up on that and there's, you're not a liability for anyone because you're yeah. just, you're coming with this singular laser focus and you combine that with you're just a nice guy. Mama raised you right, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and is it urban legend or are you still married to your childhood oh, yeah. sweetheart? Yep. Good for how, you. How do you do Susan. that? How do you do uh, that? I don't know. We Susan and I. Yeah, we've been together. Um, we met in high school. We were fifteen. Just oh I was just turning sixteen. So yeah, we got married when we were thirty. We've been together forever. So it's oh great. I love it. Yeah. That's incredible. Nice. Yeah. I mean, do you guys have the kind of normal life when you're home where it's like dinner at yeah. six? Yep. That's, That's awesome. Yeah. And, you know, we're, especially now, you know, you're, you're stuck home. You're not stuck home, but you're home, you know, right. when you're here. And it's so nice, man. I, I don't have to, uh, I don't have a trip looming over my head or like I'm, I got to leave. I'm going to leave in six days or a week, you know, and I'll be gone for three weeks or whatever it is. You know, you just get up in the morning and we have little projects we're doing. Spring is here and, you know. It's just Spring cleaning. Stuff, just yard work. And, you know, we got a big vegetable garden. We're getting back in soon. So just stuff. That's just Butters. delightfully Butters. normal. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've always, you know, it's always been that way. You know, you've, you've got home, you know, where you always want to be and life here, which is great. And then you've got the, the job, you know, you go out and yeah. Work. I mean, back in the day, you've seen all the, the ways uh, people have been able to communicate and keep their, the home fires burning. Yeah. It's so easy now with Zoom and FaceTime and yeah. s- Skype and texting, and I can yeah. send you emojis and cool memes to just let you know I'm thinking about you. But back in yeah. the day, it was like a calling card or having the right amount of change. To yeah. it, I mean, I, I even saw that. Like in 1999, I was using a calling card and calling my girlfriend from truck stops. I did it. I did it forever. You know, you'd be in Japan and you'd call home and it'd be a $300 phone call. Oh, that's you know, crazy. Yeah. So, you know, this is what we did, you know, just to, just to make sure, you know, things were okay. And what are some of those in. favorite places that you've been to in the world? Like, I mean, I'm sure you've rocked Budokan. So like yeah. you have places where it's like, Oh yeah, man. It's like, you know, Australia, Tokyo. Do you have places that come up on the calendar and you're like, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ireland's always fun. Um, you know, all through the UK, we, we go, you know, we've been there a lot. So it's always fun to go back. Germany is always great to play. Yeah. I love Italy, you know, not so much that you're playing there. It's just that you're there, you know, you're eating and traveling around, you're seeing the sights and you know, uh. fantastic. people are, are great. And uh, that's but what's your great. ethnicity. Are you like, are you half Italian or something like I'm half Italian, half Irish. Yeah, that's kind of but, exactly what I am. Yeah, well, you come out of a guy. We, you know, all them immigrants came in together on the boat at the that's same right. time. The I'm Irish and the Italians. Yeah, my father's Irish was Irish. But my mother was Italian. Both. But I think Redmond's Welsh. Yeah, I was going to ask you what is. Re- I, I'm th- I was thinking Redmond English, some kind of English, right? So I've got to do the family tree thing. I just worry about the uh, twenty three and me and the. The, you know, I don't know, the finger pricks, and then they have more information on you. I don't know. Yeah, I've, I know. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know man. <laughs> the government you know, gets you. great if they could do that, and then all of a sudden you're speaking the language of you. How many times have you been tested for COVID? I have I never been. out there. Yeah, yeah right, there you go. I know. I know. No. They have plenty they of information on you, They've Rich. got all the information <laughs> on me, buddy. Oh, my yeah. God. Are you yeah. kidding? They know more. They, they know everything they need to know. So what yeah. are you going to do? Yeah. Play drums, man. I just do that and have fun. So the other thing I like about you, I just want to say publicly, is that you don't, I don't think you have a dot com. No. And, and you're not on the socials. I just, I, I, well, I just kind of revel in the fact that you're 
your life that you're living, man, is like you you're not on there. You don't feel the pressure to be on there, and you, yeah. you just much have must have so much more time than the rest of us. I have, yeah, I, I have a lot of time. I, I don't know if I spend it well, but uh, you know, I enjoy, uh, you know, just the the la- there's no pressure, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. The social media thing, I, I'm not. I don't care what you had for breakfast, or you yeah. know, I don't want. To- picture your you know sausage in it or, uh, i don't know <laughs> i had a, I'm just I not, had a mcdonald's you know, oatmeal for i think breakfast. you're getting into more trouble all right how was yeah. that <laughs> it's actually a decent oatmeal <laughs> and it's, you know, i mean certain oh, things on their menu are just fine i gotta tell you the, i mean the coffee is like lawsuit hot we know oh, that yeah. you know, well, it's yeah. got your fruit and your nuts and <laughs> tons of steel coat oats it's crazy and I shut my mic yeah. off again. Chris, you do a great Christopher Walken. I try to do him. I can't do him. Yeah. I learned yeah, that impression from Jay uh-huh. Moore. Oh. And he came into one of my radio stations. And I, I listened to, he was on um, a, a comedy album, a Steve Lynch, Stephen Lynch comedy album. And in between every three or four songs, Jay Moore would pop in with this Walken impression. Oh, and right. I was always really good at picking up on other people, impersonating people. I right. can't directly impersonate somebody, <laughs> but if I see somebody turn. do it, yeah. I can pick it right you up. You can do it, yeah. So I just started doing it, and he came into the, to the radio station, and people had known that I'd been really good at it, so they would bring me on with him to do dueling walk-ins. And then afterwards, <laughs> he pulled me aside and coached me on how to do it. And I'm like, dude, I'm doing you doing walk-in. That's it, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> that's He's great like, you got you got to take some of the bronx out of it and you got to do the growl Get down. a little bit of that yeah sorry mickey i'm I, I really sorry i'm sorry really but we're like the, we're like the yin to the yang you know i mean this is where the wacky radio radio that's, morning Jim, show training so comes good, in man. Wow. He's thank you he's got it wow 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 oh <laughs> shock to the heart and you're to blame you so, love. so Mickey, guess what? Um, I got to visit with you a little <laughs> bit with our of our another fellow Canadian, Matt Starr. Great oh, guy, yeah. great drummer. Um, we visited with you a little bit backstage in at Irvine, I think in like yes. 2016. And I could have sworn, I think our band played one of the last shows. It might have been the very last show at that amphitheater before they took a bulldozer to it because it's yeah. like condos now. I think it's unbelievable, man. Can you believe that? Yeah. So, but can you remind me, you and I visited at the 30th, the 35th anniversary of the Reckless record in Nashville, right? Yeah. But right. was it, what, you said you, it was. That was, this is where I met you. I met you backstage, or actually it was after the show over, the, we were sort of hanging around next to the. It was a hang, yeah. Yeah, it was a hang. It was great. Um, it was you, me, Lee Kelly. Yeah. Who's one of my favorite guys. And uh, we were laughing about you. I had just met you and <laughs> you were telling me about a movie you had just finished where you were, a, I think you were a zombie or yeah. some kind of bloody covered, blood covered. Yeah, something. But the way you were, you were in my face telling me this story, you were so excited that you, you know, you, someone, you were telling somebody, this movie part you had. And I, I, I just remember laughing. I don't remember the specific story. You'll have to fill me in. But I remember just how funny it was when you... Oh, oh my <laughs> God. I must have had a, maybe a cocktail or two if I was becoming a close talker. No, no, no. It was just, you know, it was dark. It wasn't, oh, yeah. it wasn't well lit. It was an outdoor thing. Remember yeah. that? And, and you were like right here and, and you were doing this face you know, explaining the zombie thing, how you had yeah. to be a zombie in this movie. So. Oh, yeah. No, I was a detective, and this witch slices my neck open, and, of course, I got all, you know, all the blood and everything, and, and I was hanging out on set. It was, it was a lower-budget movie, and I was hanging out in this fake blood all day long, and the fake blood got into my shirt, onto my gray chest hair, and so when I had to pull the shirt off and I finally got a shower 12 hours later... Yeah big chunks of hair were coming off my chest and everything, but it's what you do. That's the commitment it takes. And you know what they say? Witches get stitches. Yeah, that's right. That's right. See? Don't forget about it. <laughs>
That's right. That's crazy. Well, we hope this is the one of the most memorable drum centric <laughs> interviews that you've ever had in your life. Are we doing a random question or no? Are you oh yeah, let's afraid? do a random question. It's Jim's favorite part of the show. Okay. My favorite part, yes. It's the random question, random question, random question of, of the day. day. Here we go. Tension bed. Here we go. <clears throat> Mickey. Yeah. What weird smell do you really enjoy? Uh, anything pink. Anything pink? Yeah. Like bubble gum? Yeah. Yeah. I could, I could see that. I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, we're all guys. So immediately I just thought our own farts. <laughs> You know, <laughs> well, there is something that was to be my said. first choice, but I, I, yeah. I was going to go with Doritos. Doritos. Is that a weird smell? They've got so many flavors now. Um, there's, the spicy ones are fantastic. Why do dogs' feet smell like Doritos? That's what I want to know. Oh, they always it. do. It's they crazy. Get, you get really deep now. Yeah. It's crazy. Well, that was so easy for you, Mickey. A lot of people really, they just stumble struggle, around on these. Struggle on the smells? They really it's just... <laughs> It's the smell questions uh, that always get them. <laughs> yeah, it's the, yeah, that's right. It's the, the, the one of the five senses. Like, what's your favorite thing to touch? That would be a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a good yeah. one. Though these are truly random questions. I mean, it's a, it's a uh, random question generator that I go to. Right. So, um, smell. so, Mickey, you know, we do like to talk thing, all, about all things music, motivation, and success. So I'd love to of, obviously leave a super positive takeaway for the audience today. But if somebody, anybody in any season of their life has something they want to accomplish, they want to go after it, they want to get it done, what has all these years of playing the drums, one of the hardest things to do consistently, taught you about manifesting dreams, goals, the life of your dreams? Uh, uh, you know, if you, if you really love to do something and it's what gives you the most sort of uh, satisfaction, pleasure, personal achievement, uh, you know, feeling that, then you got to go for it. You just, you got to do it, you know? And if you even have the slightest aptitude for it, which I was lucky enough at a really young age to be able to sit at a drum kit and bash away some time, you know? I was really lucky to do that. Be able to take that and run with it. You got to go for it. And don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. I had a couple of teachers in high school that told me, you know, you can't be a drummer. No one, you can't make a living playing drums. What? That's crazy, you know? You need to do something... Uh, and it, it stuck with me because I knew, you know, I knew that this is, this is what I would always just get the most out of, you know, and, you, and, and so, you did it and you're doing it. You just got to keep, you just keep going, man. You just keep going, you know, don't let anybody tell you, you can't do it. Cause you can't. I love it. That's, that's yeah. nice. And whew, right down the middle, man, take that <laughs> advice folks and run with it. Yeah, but I mean, you're the same. I'm sure, Rich, you're the same way. You know, you grew up knowing you could do this stuff. So, you know, if you know you can do it and it's what you really love to do and it's what makes it feels good and it's right and, you know, every time you do it, you're happy, you got to go for it. Huh? Yeah. Well, man, I'm so glad that you found the drums because you were able to change the world, man. You know, like one beat backbeat at a time, you have <laughs> shaped generations of music, man. And that's, that's your story so far. And there's still a lot more to tell. So I just want to publicly thank you for the years of inspiration and, Thanks. and thank you for your being here today. It's been great. You, you're, you're one of my heroes. You know that. And, and, oh, um, man. no, it's true. And I, I really appreciate you having me on and, and talking, you know, we could, I could go for hours and yap about, well, thank oh, you for putting up with Jim. I, 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 I thought he was talking to me about oh. the beer. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, thanks, man. And, you know, you keep, keep, the, keep the chops up on that Christopher Walken thing. You, you never know, know where it may take That might translate me. into money somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, hasn't yet. It's been 20 years. But we'll, if you we'll can never monetize know. that, you know, there's, there's got to be a way to do that. So. I could maybe do the Robert De Niro, you know. Yeah. I bet. Yeah, there's I'm definitely bad. cash. There's cash involved with that, I'll tell you. You <laughs> no. go, you go, yeah, girlfriend. Uh, well, I, I think when the uh, when the world comes back, which is hopefully right around the corner, it'd be so nice to to catch up and visit sometime. 
in Connecticut because I all my relatives are there, you know, yeah. and, it, and I just I, I got to get up there and visit with everybody. Well, when you come up, you let me know when you're coming. All right. It'd, It'd be, be great. great. It'd be great to sit and yeah, we, we can have coffee together again. Actually. It'd be awesome. And if you ever get to, you know, Los Angeles or Nashville, I mean, that'd be, you know, boom. Great. Well, you're so, back and forth all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's been an interesting, uh, interesting journey. I'm just trying to grow some other creative pursuits. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, good for you. Thanks, man. Thank you so much, man. Um, well, guys, you heard it here first. The one and only Mickey Curry. Check out Mickey Curry on allmusic.com. And of course, we are going to have a cool Spotify playlist that I've put together. It's going to be in the show notes. Jim, as always, thank you for your time and talents. Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. And to all the listeners out there, just want to thank you guys for the support. I got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And as always, subscribe, share, rate, and review. It really helps us. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We'll be here, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Mickey. Thanks, Dan. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.